So welcome back, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode and another edition of Mastering the Life with yours truly, Stevie Jones, National Director of Miss Supernational Trinidad and Tobago. It's an overcast day here in Trini, as we say. Um, the weather is cold, but I'm sure you can feel the love and the warmth of our hearts. And joining me today for a little sit-down chat over coffee is one of our beautiful Miss Supernational Trans Tobago finalists. She is Carissa Bislal, and she is actually representing the beautiful community of Diamond Village in San Fernando. Carissa, my love, welcome. How are you? Hi, I am good for now. No complaints. And how are you? I am good. Today is actually um, one of the better days. Um, and I know we've all been having our own fair share of hashtag COVID-19 struggles. Yes. <laughs> but today, today is a better day. Thank God. Today is a better day. I have, I have you here with me. You're, I've been chatting with some of your other super sisters. Um, it's good to be at home with my family and to be sharing this cup of warm chocolate on this cold Friday afternoon. What's the weather like in South? Um, it was raining since last night. So yeah. It just used up, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's raining really difficult. Um, heavy, I'm, I mean, my bad. Heavy. It's been mm -hmm. really, really heavy so, um, whole morning. Right. So it's now easing up a little. A little bit. Right. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Well, like, at least you're inside and you're warm. So, girl, listen, we haven't, we haven't seen each other in a while. We haven't had a heart-to-heart -heart in a while because I've been doing my thing and you've been doing your thing. Uh, yes. You've had um, other facilitators for some of your training sessions online. So, this, the, uh, these episodes, rather, of uh, Mastering the Life, for those of you who are uh, only now joining into this live stream um, is actually part of the super influence influencer uh, challenges, one of the many, but more particularly, more than a challenge, it's really just an opportunity to sit and to get to know a little bit about our delegates, the lives that they live and things that affect them, things that make them happy or, or angry um, and some of their passions that they would love to be able to champion. So today is your lucky day. So Carrie, let's talk a little bit about what's your life been like since you've been home for the past two, three months because of um, COVID-19. Um, I would say personally, it's been a mental strain. Mm -hmm. And it's not only because of the COVID-19, I was employed and I ended up leaving my job because I was held at gunpoint in the workplace. So um, that kind of took a mental effect on me. Pause. Say that again. Yeah. Um, I finished school last year and mm -hmm. I decided that I just wanted to help um, like earn an income before I go back to studying. Mm -hmm. So I worked at a lotto machine and I got held at gunpoint. Wow. Yeah. So since then, I've been kind of traumatized. And um, so I, I worked a few months and I realized that it wasn't really much of a change. Even if someone walks in, I would just get so scared and start to panic. Of course. So, right. So I decided, you know what, I would leave the job and take some time for myself. I was home from right before COVID-19 hit us in Trinidad, and it's been a mental strain being home constantly. I mean, I do get to spend time with my dad and my brother, but still yeah. just being home. <laughs> and the pageant really did help me to cope with it because it gave me something to occupy my time with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Carrie, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, this is the first time that I'm... I'm consciously hearing it. And I'm saying consciously because you may have mentioned this before. Yeah. But I'm saying consciously because it's actually just, it's just sinking in. So, so trauma is a real thing. 
um, I, 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 it's one of those moments where I have to say that I understand that trauma because I've been in a situation where I have been held up three times in my life at gunpoint, um, different locations in Trinidad. So I, I get it. I understand. I, I get it. But as much as I get it, your experience is your experience. Um, right. Especially to the point where um, it's affected your livelihood, where you felt that you really needed to, you needed to escape that particular environment, which, which it took place. Just take a step back mm-hmm. and reevaluate everything because it reached yeah. a point where even if I'm out with my family and I see a particular person wearing a hat, you feel nervous. Or if they have a bag, I just start to panic on the spot. Mm-hmm. So, have you? I I know it's recent, and it it takes each one of us, um, because trauma affects us differently, um, and our healing process uh, is measured differently one to another. Um, have you in any way? been able to confront excuse me to confront that trauma and begin dealing with it well I started by talking about it because the day that I got held up I I came home I told my dad what happened Mm -hmm. and then after that I was just inside right through I didn't want to see people I was just I was just so much afraid and um Recently, I started to talk about it, and I realized that it helped me by just talking about it and hearing the way people respond. And, um, well, I would say I'm a spiritual person, so I do a lot of prayers. Prayer, and I yeah. really thank God that that day it was just a hold up and nothing more. Nothing more, correct, because we've heard of, of, of so many of those situations which escalated, like it went from zero to a thousand, like real quick. Real quick. And again, you, you, you don't know what, what triggers people, you know, sometimes even your, even your submission could trigger, could trigger someone. So in your mind, you might be, you might think, okay, well, let me just surrender and give up and give you what you want. And that might actually be just, you know, I am happy that you're okay. I'm I'm happy that one, you're alive. um, And that at least there is a, a physical safe space for you. But I also want to encourage you to, to take your time, to want to take your time with this process, but to also give yourself permission to enter more deeply into the different phases of grief and of healing, because what has happened to you was not your fault. Um, right. and, and it's, that's the first place we go to. You know, you, you, you blame yourself because, you know, maybe you could have done things differently. Maybe you should have been more alert, more aware, you know, and that takes a toll to be honest when it right before it happened um i had my suspicion but i have this mm. thing where i don't like to look at the negative yeah. so it was a rainy day just like today and um two of them walked in and they had a rag over their head so i didn't really take her up for it because i was like rain falling even i do do that i would cover my head and run into a place like a Yes. Right, like with shelter, not yes. knowing that was their way of blocking off the camera from seeing their feet. If I may ask, because I, I, I can just imagine how difficult this is for you to talk about now. Um, but from then, from then to now, has there been any um, further investigation into that particular scenario? Um, well, the officers who came, you know, they were really helpful. They talked to me about it. They always message and say, you know, if I need to talk to somebody about it, just message them or call them, let them know about it, like what I, I went through. Mm-hmm. And they caught him a few weeks after the guys who robbed us because um, they were doing it right in an area, in our area, exact, to be exact. And they were targeting different um, businesses. Businesses. So eventually, they just pretty squat up with them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, at least, at least justice was 
had appeared to be saved. And you know, that, that, that takes me to the point of how, how do you feel when you look not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but you look outside, case in point, what's happening in the United States and in many other countries where there is so much of racial profiling um, and people's lives are being attacked for want of a, a better way of phrasing that, but really it's being attacked, not just discriminated against. But what makes it more painful is that innocent lives are being, um, are being taken away. How does that affect you in any way? Well, you see, it deals with racism, right? And my view on it is that we were not born a racist, we were not born a thief. We were not born murderers. Yeah, those are things it's you learn. Something that, that was learned. And if we can learn it, then it means that we can forget it and move forward. If you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah, we if you learn it, then you can unlearn it. Right. And as my generation, my, what I want to do is try to help change racism. And the reason why I say my generation, if this has been happening for so many years before us, where people like Martin Luther King, right? Mm -hmm. He fought against it, mm -hmm. and he was assassinated for his belief. Yes. And if and if racism didn't stop then, it it meant that it came back for us. You know, history is repeating. repeating we, need okay. change, we need to change to that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, I was chatting about this with some of your other sisters and the, 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 the topic and the conversation about Black Lives Matter, or Lives Matter, and every other, every other marginalized group of society matters, especially once the word life is associated with it, you know? Um, but the truth is, um, Carrie, is that we... We may not be able to, we not we may not be able to, we cannot change the entire world. But I, I think the change that we are all so deeply longing for and desiring for, it starts, it starts with me. It starts with my mentality. The same way that you could talk about your trauma and how your trauma has affected you, there are a lot of our people who are deeply wounded, deeply traumatized because they were born into a generation and into a system. And so by way, by way of adopting, and it's, it's what we call the generational curse. So you were born into a system, whether you were born into poverty or you were born into some form of racial prejudice or any other form of prejudice. And you're right, you learn it because your psyche learns what is taught to you and what you're exposed to from young. So a lot of, a lot of our generation, as you call them, um, it, it's, it's, it's their way of life. And they don't know anything other than that. They don't know anything other than the language of hate. And that's where we as pageant individuals come in, where we can mm -hmm. now help to raise awareness on topics like this. Like this. Mm -hmm. Because if awareness isn't raised, then it will keep repeating itself constantly over and over. Mm -hmm. But do you think awareness is sufficient though? I mean, there's I lots of awareness. It's, it's the way we approach it, I think. And it's just uh, like the first step to helping. That's, the, you know, baby steps. Yeah. And it's the first step to helping. And that is why I, like, I'm sure you saw my charity video. And that is why I'm working with orphans. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of um, statistics show that orphans usually go down that part of Crime. And that is where I want to change the way we look at them, give mm -hmm. them a little hope to make their lives a bit better. Yeah. But why do you think so, though? What, what's, your, what's your position on, I mean, is that a language that statistically is shown that um, children who are abandoned or who grew up in an orphanage system, that the, the percentage rate shows that they are likely the ones to enter into a life of crime? Well, from what I did my research and it came up that, you know, when orphans leave the system, they wouldn't have 
financial stability to make ends meet. So then they would have to find ways of getting that, find ways of getting money to survive. And if they can't get a job, what road would they really go to? So that's my view on it. And that's why my charity is really based on helping them financially. My goal is to open bank accounts for them so that when they do leave, they would have some sort of financial stability when they enter the real world. But what about people who are financially stable but still participate in a life of crime? There is white collar crime. There are people who have billions of dollars and big businesses. And those are the ones who are the sanctions of the small man. The small man most times are the ones on the ground who, who are who do any dirty work, so to speak. So what do you say to that? Well, with respect to that, I think as an individual, like personally, you need to know it's like you know what is wrong, you know what is right. And they have this choice, and it was their choice. So I wouldn't know how to address something like that. Mm -hmm. to say. But I believe that if they were empowered as youth, then they would have been able to be knowledgeable on certain situations and know which path they want to go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I'm hearing you saying is <clears throat> it's not just about being knowledgeable, yeah? Because you can have a lot of knowledge and, and, and use your knowledge to do, to do wrong and to hurt others. Um, I mean, we, we can count, we can identify how many very intelligent, knowledgeable people we have in this country, but are not pro-life in their actions, so to speak. But we're not going to call any names. But I, I think it, it also comes back to um, your moral and your ethical and your spiritual values. All, are, all of which I think are, are degenerating. I mean, when you look at the image of family life, Carissa, you almost want to say to yourself, well, no wonder, well, no wonder why you are behaving the way that you're behaving. No wonder why you're making the decisions that you're behaving because your family unit, it's, it's, they don't know any better. Well, that, that's another thing. It's, Back to the point where I spoke about racism, you know, mm -hmm. it's what they learn. So, Correct. Yeah, it's, it's really because we are born as a blank slate. So it's what we learn growing up is what we would tend to do as an adult. And we would then pass yeah. down that knowledge that we have, mm -hmm. whether it be right or wrong, to, uh, to the next generation. And it will just be a cycle repeating itself constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Ah, circle of life, circle of life. Carrie, tell, tell the people who are joining this, this conversation here, who are looking on and listening on, because I know you have, you have a lot of supporters. Uh, I didn't realize that you were such a celebrity. But <laughs> what, what is it about the Miss Supernational organization, whether internationally or locally here, what is it that is so attractive? What, what really drew you to it? Well, as you know, last year I entered, I came to the screen. I think you should tell people that story. And yeah, so last year I did screen for Miss Supernational Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get through to be a finalist, right? But I got an opportunity to represent Trinidad regionally instead of internationally. And I think that that really prepared me for this pageant. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the advertisements going around, I told my brother, I was like, Kel, you know, I need to enter back. <laughs> I think I have the experience now because having knowledge on pageants and actually having some experience really makes a difference. Because yeah. being there, I was introduced to so many cultures. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. That's okay. Being there, I was introduced to so many cultures that... Yeah. I can now implement it over here. And sure. one thing I would like to share is that in that pageant, um, there was this one particular individual. She came up to me and she was like, you know, you really have a lot of potential. I can see you one day making it international, right? Mm -hmm. And then she further went on to say, um, one bit of advice I would give you, 
is don't ever compete with your content with the other delegates compete with yourself be your best self and since then i think that really speaks to me and that's what i brought to this pageant i am not competing with anyone i'm competing to be the best me the best version of me that sounds like something Gio would say. <laughs> I am I'm very happy to hear you say that. Uh, it's it's a different approach. I think it's a very mature approach. It may be received differently because people might think, oh God, she feels she's a diva, she feels she's weak. But but you're right. I, you know, very fundamentally, sometimes we are our biggest enemy. We are our biggest hurdle, and there is that inner saboteur that always tells us that we're not good enough, you're not strong enough, and you don't have enough capacity to be able to go to the next level or to walk another mile. So you're right, you, you are really essentially competing with, with yourself and with all of the things of yourself. So on that note, do you see um, the type of training that you're getting here? Do you... Do you see that as being anything different from what you may have experienced before? Um, very different because in the past pageant where I, in which I entered, they really, it was really like a three days pageant in terms of the first day we got to meet, there were rehearsals, second day, repeat rehearsals, dinner, and then the night of the shoot. So it's not like, you know how in Supranational they teach us about our self and self-love, self-motivation. Because I remember the first class we had with you and the way you spoke, it really made me take a step back and reevaluate everything that I knew. It's simple things that you said, you know, really spoke to me. And that is the difference from Supranational to the other pageants which I entered. And you know, that's not to say that the other, um, the other pageant brands aren't doing it. And, and it, it links back to exactly what you said just a short while ago about not competing with other delegates. You know, for us, we're not competing against another brand. This is really about us staying true and daily recommitting ourselves to what we believe in. And what we do believe in is that we, that we should be taking a more integrated approach. And we love to use the word holistic, so I'm going to use the word a more holistic approach. Um, to, to, to the training because you can teach someone to walk and to slay a runway. You could teach them styling. You could teach them how to do their makeup well. You can teach someone good elocution. And those things are important because those are also part components of your training in a beauty pageant. But there are a lot of things that our, our young women and our young men who get into pageantry, and particularly pageantry, have never been taught. And you begin to see it when we do this. But you see, when we do these sit down and we get to know people, and you see when people, when the girls start to get competitive and all the claws start to come out and you see all of the nastiness, that's when you, you begin to realize, wait, now, this is, no matter how you dress this up, it's still going to look ugly because it's, it's coming from inside, you know, people's, their bad character and their, their lack of, of, of understanding of the human dynamic, it begins to show. What do you think happens when, when you go to a competition with 80-something, 90-something plus girls from all around the world who've I been doing this? To believe in yourself. I believe in believing in yourself. You need to be your best self when you go there and don't feel threatened by anyone. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing in the past pageants. When, when I go, I just think, okay, this is about me getting experience because that is my goal, to get my story out there, to motivate you to have suffered loss. And I want to show um, you that even though life may be tough right now, that you can work to what you want and achieve it. And that's why I really entered pageants. Mm -hmm. And from my first pageant to now, I believe that I, I am a completely different person. I'm sure you realize this. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm smiling. I, I, let me tell you, I, I, I'll be brutally honest. We, right now, we're not, we're not judging anybody. And I'm taking my director's hat off. When there are, there are two of you in particular who are in this cohort that screened last year and did not make, it, did not make the live cut. 
And the two of you are back in again. I'm like, what is, what is happening? They're not leaving us alone. And I am so impressed, Carissa, particularly with you. And I'm, I'm saying you, I'm impressed with, with the others as well. But I'm impressed with you because I thought to myself, the very fact that you decided to come back, it means that you're searching for something. And not only are you searching for something, I think when we sat and we were deliberating uh, um, after the preliminary screening, I thought to myself, maybe there is something that Carissa needs to see and needs to get out of her system in this, in this particular space. And I think she, she deserves an opportunity to come back. And, and you know, everybody else, I mean, by virtue of your scores, you, you made it into the live round. Um, and and that's, that's what the rubric dictates. Once your scores are high enough, it gets you in. But I'm glad you came back. I am so happy you came back. I can't wait to see what's, what's going to happen after these makeovers. I mean, I, I really am um, thankful that you saw the change because I am trying to work on myself with. So it really means a lot that you saw it. And one thing I always remembered from last year's screening is that um, when I came, one of, the, one of the judges told me um, how I seemed really nervous because it was the first time I ever did a screening. So I didn't have the experience or anything, so I just walked in there not knowing what to expect. Yeah. And there was um, this one person in particular who asked me to show him a dance. I mm. think it's Ramon. It's I Ramon, think. yes. Yes. And um, afterwards, he went on to tell me I was a completely different person before and after I danced. Mm -hmm. And before I go out to, to perform, I should always do a do small the dance. step, yes. And I have been doing that and I have been seeing the changes. Like, it really helped me since then. Yeah. I think he's, you're going to put a smile on his face when he hears this. And, and we spoke about it. We spoke about that in interview because I think a lot of people remembered, at least for those who were part of the journey from last year, they referenced that. People were like, um, Carissa, that's the girl who taught us how to dance. And I was like, yep, that's her, that's her. So it's, it's good to have you back, sweetheart. And I, I can't wait to see, you know, what you're going to do with, with your training from, from, from before, as well as, as what, what you, how you're going to apply what you're learning here. It's, it's really an exciting thing to, to watch the process. Um, some, some people peak faster than others um, and at, different, at a different rate. So I can't wait to see how you're going to blossom. So we, we are living through um, a very challenging time. We are in what we call, we are in the belly of, of the pandemic. And, and I'm praying that soon we'll be able to change the narrative to sound more post-pandemic. Do you see beauty pageantry still being relative now? Um, in a post-pandemic era, even to this date, mm -hmm. I personally believe it is something that should continue. It should not be stopped because when you look at a beauty pageant, you really see young leaders coming out of that pageant. Mm -hmm. motivation motivational speakers coming out there and each person who enters a pageant they do some sort of charity so it means that they are still spreading positivity in the world right. and i know that in a post pandemic era it will have a lot of struggle in terms of financially considering everything is basically locked down right now mm -hmm. there will be some sort of financial struggle but I think that it is something that should continue, you know, get people to tell their stories. And that's one thing that I appreciate what you said last time we spoke, where you said, you know, it is your duty to tell your story. It doesn't matter who wants to hear it, but it is your duty. And I think that is something that is essential in pageantry. And that, that is what makes pageantry so important. Yeah, of course. And I think the more people like yourself, young women like yourself and, and your other sisters, and the generations of them who have been committed to the cause, the more, and it's not just about telling a story because you could tell a story and then walk away. Right. But you tell your story with a certain conviction, but then 
there should be something that drives you to create some kind of impact and to generate some type of long lasting change, even if it's a small change. So, because a lot of people could tell stories, a lot of people are very good at talking, but few people really have the capacity and the tenacity to be able to allow their own stories and the woundedness of their story to become transformative material so that other people's lives can be improved. I mean, that's what our ancestors did for us. We didn't have to live through the type of slavery that existed in the 14 and 1500s. I mean, we are still living through some form of modern day slavery, but it's not the same. Like, yeah, exactly. you know, you understand? The sacrifices that our parents made. Correct. Because I know my dad tells me all the time, he's like, the life he's building for me is because he don't want me to live the life that he had to live, mm-hmm. the struggles he had to face. So it's not just yeah. so back in the generation, but as simple as our parents and the things they do for us. Yeah, of course. One of the things that excites me, Carissa, and I'm, I, I know that you are excited as well, and I know that your, your supporters and your fans are excited, is I, we, we intimately are getting an opportunity to find out more about who are these 14 young women. And each one of you are bringing your own, your own uh, set of strengths and your own um, experience of, of your scars and your woodenness and your failures. Um, and it's not one against the other. It's, it's both things combined that makes up the whole person. And that's, that's the integrated approach that we're talking about. But to me, what I, what I look forward to and I can't wait to see is when we're able to put hair and makeup and beautiful dresses to those stories. Like, I can't wait to see you slay a runway in, in, a gown, in a fabulous designer wear or in your swimsuit and your killer heels and your hair well done. And I can't wait to see you walk toward a microphone and open your mouth and speak your truth. Like, I think that is what gets me Excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, when yeah. I sit and I think about the pageant, it really, it, it's a bit sad to know that we have to be doing this in, a, in the middle of a pandemic where we don't get to actually meet and interact, you know, mm-hmm. but you still accommodated us with Zoom. We still get to interact with each other, but to dress up and actually be like, girl. Yes. <laughs> It's listen, everything in everything in, in, in God's time. Everything in time. Everything in time. It's it's going to be worth it. Like I, I heard some of your other sisters saying the the day that we actually get to come together, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> so you have been you've been home. Uh, you've been studying, you've been working away, not only at the pageant, but I'm sure you were occupied doing other productive things, spending quality time with yourself and with your, your relatives and, and with your neighbors, etc. What are your hopes for the people of the community of, of South? The South region is, is known as, uh, as a very hospitable place. Um, you, we also, we always refer to the South as, as the, you know, well, first of all, all good things come from South. I'm just saying, because I'm a South man. <laughs> I, I will get punk for that because I'm a South man, born and bred, but I live all over the place, but that's fine. Um, but South is known as, as, the, as the home of, of hospitality. What, what are you hoping to share with the rest of the country and by extension the world about the community of San Fernando? Um, what I want to, well, initially my aim is to help my community, right? Mm-hmm. So what I want to do is make simple changes, like empower the youth in my community. And one day I want that my, like my legacy live on, that I make a difference in someone's life Mm-hmm. And then they can then make a difference in another person's life and let that travel first nationally, then regionally, and eventually internationally. My aim is really to help make a difference. How do you propose to do that? Um, well, first, 
I know that um, my charity, I didn't really include self um, youth empowerment, mm -hmm. but then I saw another delegate and, you know, she messaged me and she was like, she wants to be a part of my initiative. Wow. And I was like, okay, that, that's great because then you can come and do workshops based nice. on youth empowerment in my, in my initiative as well. So we can work hand in hand. So Beautiful. it's things like that that I want to let you will know that in pageantry, we don't compete, but it's really a sisterhood bond we are forming. Fabulous. Fabulous. So you, you, you very well know a couple of days ago, our international president, Charad von Lipinski, officially launched the Community Service Initiative. Yeah. And it's called From, From the Ground Up, which is really, it, what that really means is it's a grassroots movement type of work that each one of you, um, at, more you, and less of, of, the, of the franchise, because this is really going to be birthed in your heart, and it's going to lean on your own strengths and the strengths of your community. Um, but it's really meant to be serving the people of your immediate community in small, very organic ways. It doesn't have to be big and glamorous and over the top. Tell us a little bit about your social responsibility project. So my social responsibility project is called the Encouraging Hope Foundation. So initially when I was thinking about what charity I want to work with or invest in, I thought, well, my brother actually, he pitched the idea of working with orphans. But then I was like, that's a charity that everyone goes to. Mm. Everyone wants to help orphans, right? Yeah. But then after I slept on it and then I was like, you know, that's a good idea. But instead of helping them um, only in the orphanage, we can help them when they leave the orphanage. So that is my goal, to host workshops, to teach them about leadership skills, financial um, management and with that incorporate creative arts and the reason for that is dancing has changed my life in so many ways that I want to share my passion with others okay. and I know plenty of people may be thinking I may do it only Indian based but what I'm doing is trying to incorporate everything like singing I want to right now I'm trying to locate a contemporary dancer because my circle of friends it's really Indian dancers. So I'm looking for a contemporary dancer who is willing to work as well. So if a person is not just, if they are not interested in Indian dancing, we would have other um, creative arts programs for them to go into. Right. And then eventually host fundraisers like concerts and um, activity days to raise money. And then I would put it into a bank account for them. Right. So when sure. they do use the orphanage, they can have some sort of money to get them by. And mm -hmm. um, I, then I thought, you know, creative arts is so limited to an extent because not everyone would want to play an instrument. Not everyone would want to sing. So I right. thought maybe if I can get people to help with sports and we can host like cricket tournaments, small, mm -hmm. but it will be a way of getting money into the system. So that we would not be fully dependent on donations. We can now earn our own money to help yeah. them. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Who, in, in just the off the top of your head, who are some people in the industry in terms of, because of course you're doing charity. So to be able to do charitable work um, and to be able to sustain the work that you're doing as it grows, you're going to need the support of other bodies who are in a better position to be able to support what you do. Who are some of those, those people that you, you think are going to be interested from a corporate social responsibility perspective? Well, um, I'm sure you have seen I've been doing lives of recently. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that I want to first raise awareness on creative arts and the creative arts industry. Because I know being a dancer, we do face struggles in terms of performing, getting our name out there, building our brand. But paid. Are, yeah, because it's a competition, basically, where you have to fight against someone to get your name out there. So what I've been doing is locating people who are in the industry. Like recently, I did an interview with Sabir Ramsa, our Mr. Supranational 2018. And he just gave me a little rundown about how it was for him 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just the support that I get so far. They are like, you know, it's a different approach and they are looking forward to helping with it when it is fully developed. Mm -hmm. But due to COVID, you know, I'm just trying to get the word out there about my charity and spread awareness about it. So right. after the lockdown, then I can take that jump into it and actually right. start. Do you, do you think that your business coaching sessions that you are currently doing here at Supra will help you to give some form and shape um, to, to your social project? Um, well, yes, because I remember the first um, class we had where we were told that after a while, the business should be self-sustainable. Right. And that is what really had me thinking to fundraisers so that we wouldn't be dependent on just um, corporate donations. Sponsors, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I really just want to get youth involved as well. So I think that all are just ties in with the initiative. Good, good. Well, I would, as I've said to, to the other girls, continue to explore, continue to remain open to the possibilities. Um, because the more people that you meet and, and as you engage them in conversation and you begin to share your idea, uh, it begins to grow and evolve. So try not to, to put your passion into a box. Allow it to grow organically and watch it blossom. And don't be afraid if you need to make changes along the way and if you need to revisit your, your vision and your mission and, and, and how you're building the brand and that kind of thing. Because... I am a creative entrepreneur. I, I have my own business. I left the corporate world a while ago and it, it would have hurt me a lot more if I was too definitive about things, especially as a creative. Because when you're in business, you always have to leave, you have to leave room for risk. Nobody knew that we were going to be living through a pandemic. And to the types of systems and procedures that we should have had in place, for a rainy day, so to speak, would not, you know? So take your time and develop your business model and, and do, it, do it well because I always say it's better to do it slow and steady than to bite more than you can chew and then you end up choking and it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah? And that's why I really based mine in my community phase because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have been asking if I will just be um, doing it in South. Mm -hmm. But I told them, I want to start in South, make the changes in my community. And then yeah. if, and I, then, get a, if right. I get volunteers, then we can spread it national, nationwide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So dedicate a notebook or a journal to your project. And everything that you do, every time you dream it, every time you have a conversation with somebody, or you read some things, write it down. Because the, the power of journaling, that's what we've been doing with Crowns and Sashes and with MSTT because, I mean, it's, 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 it's bigger than us, you know? And we have to be able to, to grow into it and allow it to become a part of us so that there is some kind of synergy always happening, you know? But I, will, I trust in you, Carissa, and I believe that you're going to do very well in your life. So, Keep your, keep your feet on the ground, keep your head above water, um, and always be guided by your divine spirit that is always shining a light on your life. And that's why you're protected. It's why you'll be able to escape situations because you're, you're protected. This has been very edifying for me. I don't know if you can say the same. I probably was no good in this interview for you at all. Um, but it's good to spend some time with you and I'm so glad that you're able to share your story um, and to share your passions with the public, um, with your friends and your supporters. If there are people who are on this live or who at some point will view it, will view this video, and they would like to be able to support Carissa Bisbal and to support the work that you are doing as well as the work of the franchise, tell us, how can we connect with you? So you can reach out on my official Facebook page, it is Carissa Bislal dash Miss Supranational Finalist 2020. Mm -hmm. Or you can check me out on Instagram at k.bislal underscore mstt finalist 2020. Fantastic. And in the event that you 
you don't remember that that very long um, handle uh, or if by chance you want to be able to expand your giving because we are also open to your to your kindness you can reach out to us our handle is at miss supernational tt or you can email us at crowns and the sashes 868 at gmail.com our telephone numbers are up um, on all of our platforms um, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So we are reachable. Um, and we encourage you to join the movement, join the super family, and become a part of some positive um, and quality change in our communities for a better Trinidad and Tobago and for a better world. Carissa, my love, thank you so much for this sit down. And thank you to those of you at home for joining us on another episode of Mastering the Life with yours truly. Until next time, we wish you and your families a safe weekend or whenever you're viewing this video. And whatever you do, please make sure wear your masks when you're going out. Make sure you continue to wash your hands, to sanitize your environment, practice your social distancing, and to be mindful of those around you. So wishing you all the very best. Bye for now.